Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the uh, Mato Institute for Policy Research. Uh, this is Café Baltique on uh, the uh, politics of sport. Uh, my name is Robert Ermel, and I am the Director of Operations for the Mato Institute for Policy Research. Um, what we do at the Institute is we uh, try to encourage and enhance public policy discourse by bringing together the things that happen at the university and bringing it out into the community, engaging practitioners and uh, um, experts and uh, the academic community as a whole and trying to uh, maybe come up with some different uh, dialogues and different options that you would otherwise be experienced. Uh, the Citizen Series, which uh, the Catholic Politics is a part of, um, is the engagement pillar of MIPR. Um, what we do in this series is we seek to uh, bring policy and political issues to the broader community in an accessible format. By bringing together content experts, policymakers, practitioners on these issues, we hope to stimulate audience uh, participation and dialogue, uh, both here and later in the online communities where we put uh, the event itself uh, recorded. We do not record the question and answer period that follows, but we do record um, the event itself. Our moderator this evening for this event is uh, Dr. Douglas Brown. Dr. Brown is the uh, Dean of the Faculty of Kinesiology and Recreation Management at the University of Manitoba, um, where he's also an Associate Professor. Um, I want to thank uh, all of you for coming out because we can't do this without you being here. It doesn't make any sense to do it if you're not here um, on this beautiful prairie winter evening. Um, at the end of today's discussion, I encourage you to complete the feedback forms uh, that are on your chairs. And I will now uh, pass the mic to Dr. Brown to start us off and to introduce our distinguished panel. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I am certain that we're going to have an interesting uh, series of presentations and uh, an engaged conversation with questions afterwards. Uh, it's an auspicious time to have a panel like this, and I'm sure that's not lost on the, on the organizers. We are one day away from the eve of the opening of the um, most expensive Olympic Winter Games, well, actually the most expensive Olympic Games in history in a um, uh, pretty neutral political country called Russia. Um, there's been lots of, lots of um, years of debate and discussion about the, the role that um, these games will have in the history of sport in general. It's also worthy to note that 2014 we'll see the World Cup of Soccer hosted in uh, Rio de Janeiro, which will be the next host of the, the Summer Olympic Games. Uh, but there's never a time when we can't talk about the relationship between sport and politics, and I just wanted to make a couple remarks that uh, sport has never been separate from uh, separate from politics. Uh, if you go back as far as the ancient Greeks, of course, it was city-states who sent representatives to the four uh, crown games of the ancient world. In medieval times, it was warlords who sent their knights to tournaments to compete and represent themselves. And in modern times, in spite of the sport for sport's sake movement, we know full well that the politics of social class uh, defined who could compete with whom. Uh, tonight, I want to also encourage the audience and the panelists to recognize that when we talk about politics, we don't necessarily need to restrict ourselves to the discussion of big P politics or state politics, but we should also keep in mind that sport is a performative cultural practice where we put our bodies in front of others and against others and with others. And so often what gets left behind is the small P politics that influence sport and the way people take meaning from this particular cultural pastime. So with that brief preface, I'd like to get the ball rolling. I'm going to begin with Dr. Russell Field, who is an assistant professor at the University of Manitoba in the Faculty of Kinesiology and Rec Management. Uh, Russell is a historian who is interested in multi-sport events, uh, including the Olympic Games, um, as well as international sport, and he's particularly focused on the way these events are used for political forms of resistance. So I'm going to turn it over to Russell right now. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Um, I want to make some very broad comments. Um, I'm going to focus on the Winter Olympic Games as uh, I move this away from me. I'm quite ambulatory when I speak, as my students will attest. So this is, um, I feel like I'm on the dating game. I think. <laughs> 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 um, 
So, uh, it's, it's pretty strange, but I'm going to talk about the Winter Olympic Games as, uh, to which the, the title slide there attests. Uh, I'm going to try to keep myself uh, to the ten minutes I've been given, though one of my colleagues has reminded me that I have a rather elastic sense of time. Oh, no, no, no. Then, 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 then I feel like Wayne Newton, so... Uh, you can't do that. Uh, the only challenge is that poor Brent is now going to have to flip through as many slides as humanly possible. Uh, so I can get through this, but I want to talk, um, the, the panel is about sport and politics. I want to focus, uh, as Doug has suggested, on the Winter Olympic Games, uh, because of the timing uh, of where we are, and um, try in as broad brushstrokes as possible, I suppose, uh, to sketch out, um, because this was uh, the brief that I was, with which I was tasked, to uh, um, sketch out in some broad brushstrokes the way in which uh, the Olympic Games have engaged with as Doug phrased them, uh, big P politics, um, uh, and how that engagement has changed over time. Uh, and we're here in some sense because of Sochi uh, and the ways in which uh, Sochi, though it's not unique, is uh, engaging with politics uh, and or at least been confronted by a number of political issues. Um, and I want to start... Um, uh, this, is, this is going to get not subtle. Uh, I want to start in 1960, which when the Olympic uh, calendar began in 1960, uh, the Olympic movement uh, was in Squaw Valley for the Winter Olympic Games, a Winter Olympics that was uh, criticized by the leaders of the Olympic movement for being far too commercialized. Uh, Walt Disney had been hired to, to, um, uh, to uh, design the pageants uh, connected to the ceremonies, and during which the Olympic movement was de dealing with internal debates around the amateur movement. These are the internal politics of the Olympic movement in the 1960s as we enter the decade. Um, but uh, more broadly, there was throughout the decade of the 60s, and these are the broad brushstrokes because I'm going to talk in decades, um, uh, there's lots of other things going on and they eventually become part of the Olympic movement, whether it was uh, protests uh, by the, in, the, in that famed summer of 1968 in Prague or in uh, Chicago and Paris, uh, or throughout uh, the uh, the Western world around the, the Vietnam uh, War, or uh, a variety of protests in the United States uh, around issues of inequality uh, connected to race. Uh, these broad currents of social dissent uh, are um, germane to the 1960s, and they become connected to the Olympic movement in some very high-profile ways, uh, or at least become connected to sport in some very high-profile ways, uh, through a series of athletes uh, who all become well-known, uh, African-American athletes, well-known for their connection uh, to connecting their visibility uh, through sport to their political interests and their political uh, uh, and social, kind of social justice issues. Um, these uh, manifest themselves at the Olympic Games most prominently through the uh, Olympic Project for Human Rights, uh, founded by uh, San Jose State sociologist uh, Harry Edwards, in the uh, mid 1960s, which leads, uh, which uh, tried to galvanize support among African American athletes, most prominently African American male athletes, um, around issues of protest and to use the the platform and the forum of the Olympic Games to protest the exploitation of Black Africans, uh, sorry, uh, Black African Americans. Um, and was uh, most prominently realized in the podium protest of John Carlos and Tommy Smith in the gold medal ceremony for the 200 meters uh, at the Mexico City Olympics in 1968. Um, a protest uh, that seemed, uh, and that has generated a lot of study among scholars in the intervening years, seemed uh, spontaneous at the time, was anything, anything but in many ways. Uh, though a lot of people didn't know Smith and Carlos were about to do this, though one of the interesting side stories to this photograph, which is this photograph familiar to people? Um, one of the interesting side notes to this photograph, and to give you a sense of the planning that went into it, is that the um, not only are Smith and Carlos uh, holding, uh, sharing a pair of black gloves and holding up one uh, uh, gloved fist, uh, they were not wearing their shoes as a symbol of uh, poverty in the black community. They're also wearing the button of the Olympic Project for Human Rights, which was on the previous slide, to which I'm not going to make Brent go back. Um, he's got enough work to do. But what's lesser known is that the silver medalist in the race, Peter Norman of Australia, is wearing in, uh, in solidarity the, the button of the Olympic Pro Project for Human Rights, which you can actually see in the photo. It's the, the white circle, obviously. So this is, in the 1960s, is perhaps the most uh, symbolic or iconic moment of the intersection of uh, sport and politics. 
in the Western world. But there are others. And uh, one of the ones I want to take you to, my time is dwindling much more rapidly than I want, was, was this event. And I asked you how many had heard of the Smith and Carlos photo. I'm guessing far fewer of you have heard of this particular event. But uh, it was an attempt in 1963, I wanted just at least briefly to mention it, um, uh, by the uh, countries of the non-aligned movement, or what was also self-identified and in a non-pejorative sense, the third world, to create a counter-Olympic Games, to organize their own multi-sport event uh, outside of the IOC, to place in Jakarta in November of 1963, uh, organized uh, uh, ostensibly by the government of Indonesia, led by its uh, iconic uh, president, uh, President Sukarno there on the left, uh, at the, the enormous uh, Bung Karno Stadium in uh, Jakarta. Uh, and an interesting event for a number of reasons, uh, for me not least of which because it's a major focus of my research at the moment, but um, this is where we go really fast, right? Uh, it was an event very much designed around um, the politics of decolonization and overtly connected sport and politics and is important because the IOC denied any connection between sport and politics. The IOC uh, felt strongly that their event should have nothing to do with politics, that politics should not impinge upon sport. This was an event that felt politics and sport were intimately related and should be acknowledged. But it was an event very much styled along the Olympic Games. And here we go, right? Uh, it had a torch relay, and where it led to a lighting of the uh, ceremonial flame, uh, and opening ceremonies with a parade of nations in front of a very happy head of state. A raising of not the Olympic flag, but the Ganefo flag. Ganefo is short form. Out, uh, you're getting ahead of me now, Brent. I thought we were saying um, athletes stayed in a specialized village built for them uh, and competed uh, under the banner of their country, even though most of the athletes were not there as official representatives. Uh, but in front of adoring and happy spectators, there were 100,000 people at the opening ceremonies. An event that attracted 3,000 athletes to a variety of sports, almost all of them Olympic sports. Um, that were timed and adjudicated in the ways that we would think of sport being timed and adjudicated. And medals awarded uh, to first, second, and third, exactly the way we would imagine Olympic Games progressive. And there were cultural festivities, much like a contemporary Olympic Games. And one of the other, and this is my last comment about uh, this event, Ganefa, one of the interesting things about it is not just the fact that it's an attempt in the third world to host a a counter Olympic Games, it is an event that captured the kind of geopolitics of decolonization of the of the, the this moment in the 1960s. Uh, guests arrived in Jakarta and were greeted uh, as welcomed uh, to the games, where they uh, embarked from the airport on a highway built by U.S. Uh, aid to Indonesia. Stayed in the Hotel Indonesia, at least the dignitaries, a hotel built by Japanese aid to Indonesia where they competed in the Bung Karno Stadium built by the Soviet Union uh, in 1962. Uh, this event, for me at least, captures the kind of complexities of geopolitics and decolonization in the 1960s and suggests the ways in which sport was intimately connected to other kind of political currents. I don't know why that's there. Uh, <laughs> and, but, uh, and the decade ends in Mexico City not only with Smith and Carlos uh, raising glove fists, but also uh, in the sort of in the in consistent with the theme of the of the the developing world with uh, prominent uh, though uh, covered up uh, mass executions of pro student protesters in Mexico City protesting the investment in the games and that's sort of the second strand I want to get to. Am I able to? Okay, um, we're going to go quickly. I'm probably going to skip some stuff here just so we can skip. But. Um, I will give you one, one more example and then I will uh, bite, bite my tongue. Um, but it was not only student protesters in Mexico City that were uh, challenging the games, and this is where I want to bring my comments from the third world, world to the first world, and then I will, uh, then I will uh, bow gracefully off the stage, because I, how many people remember the Denver Olympic Games? They never happened, so it was a trick question, uh, but it's good to see that you're paying attention. So Denver was awarded the Olympic Games uh, uh, for 1976, and the voters in 1972 in Denver, uh, in the same year that they elected Richard Nixon, um, also in a plebiscite, decided they did not want to invest in uh, facilities for the Olympic Games, uh, both around the cost of the Games and the um, environmental degradation. 
This is, a, in Olympic studies, a relatively well-known case of the Olympics, of, of local citizens saying no to the Olympics over political issues. What's less well-known is this case. A, a cycle, an Olympic cycle earlier than for the 1972 Olympics, but in the mid-1960s, uh, Calgary and Banff, sort of a joint bid, but mostly framed around Banff, were bidding uh, for the third time to host, and were the odds-on favorite to host the 1972 uh, Winter Olympics. And what's interesting, and I, won't, I will stop before I get to it, is that much of the protest that takes place today uh, around sport and politics, uh, whether it was in Vancouver, whether it's in Sochi, whether it be with another games, is often marginalized by the mainstream press and by Olympic organizers as being just that, marginal. Uh, fringe groups. You get lots of images in Vancouver of the black bloc and uh, anarchists breaking things, as though that somehow justifies marginalizing the, uh, the issues that are raised around protest. Harder to do that in the case of Banff in the mid-1960s for 1972 because it was people a lot like us. It was a lot of university professors saying, wait a minute, uh, it was all these kinds of groups not known for their outrageous political um, uh, fear-mongering, um, the, uh, the uh, Wildlife uh, Fund, um, saying you can't develop a national park for an Olympic Games. You can't take public land dedicated to parks and actually do development. And despite political support, uh, there was an enormous campaign for, um, uh, and this was a telegram sent to IOC delegates from media Rome to debate where the games are going again. Banff was the odds on favorite. But lost the vote, and this is where I'll stop because I've used more of my time than I should. Um, lost the vote uh, to Sapporo, uh, and largely believed uh, largely acute, uh, assumed in the, on the right side of this newspaper clip that I, I want to focus, that um, Avery Brundage was president of the IOC at the time, that the IOC had chosen to run away from controversy. That there was a local con controversy, the IOC wanted nothing to do with it, was, was the narrative that's framed. What's interesting for me, and what I won't uh, uh, burden you with in terms of slides, I'm happy to talk about later, is the way in which the IOC no longer sees local controversy, and this, this we could go to Beijing, we could talk about Sochi, we could talk about Vancouver. Local protest is now kept outside the bubble of the, uh, of the Olympic Games in a way that in the 1960s, the IOC was not in a position to engage with local protest. Uh, and I think that's one of the interesting changes uh, heading into Sochi. And I will stop there. Thank you. Great, thank you, Russell. Our next speaker is Dr. Our next speaker is Dr. Sarah Tietzel from the University of Manitoba and the Faculty of Kinesiology and Rec Management as well. Sarah is primarily a philosopher of sport, but also um, draws on historical and sociocultural um, scholarship to, to build her, her philosophical-based arguments. She's particularly engaged with uh, philosophical discourses around the Olympic Games, uh, and this, of course, incorporates discourses on uh, drugs and uh, drug testing in sport, as well as issues of gender in sport. So I turn it over to Dr. Sarah Tietzel. Thank you. I'll switch gears completely here and zone in on the topic of gender politics and the Olympic Games. So talking about current issues that we'll see um, next week, beginning in Sochi. I'll start with an acknowledgement that I'm a diehard Olympics fan and cannot wait for Friday's opening ceremonies to see how this will unfold. I'll be glued to my TV for the next two weeks. Uh, our moderator is technically my boss, so I'm not sure I should publicly declare that. <laughs> well, I do want to set up a big screen TV in the faculty. So. Perfect. <laughs> so I will be at work next week. Um, but I'm also a feminist researcher, so sometimes these two worlds uh, don't really meld together too well. Okay. Having a love of the Olympics and studying them from a feminist perspective. So, can you have that slide? Thank you. In 2014 Winter Olympic Games, so in Sochi next week, the estimate numbers, because not all rosters are complete, are that we'll see about 3,000 athletes from 88 nations um, competing for 98 medals. Because of a perception that gender issues in sport were basically solved by our second wave feminists, that there's equal opportunity for women's in sport, 
we would expect those numbers to just basically split nicely in half. To have half the medals available for women, half for men, um, equal numbers of participants, 1,500 women, 1,500 for men. But that's not really the case. We're not at that point. So I want to look at um, first some of the numbers and then some of the implications of those numbers for what's still going on today. So it's like um, very small in the bottom there. You can see some of the ratios of the percentage of women competing in the Winter Olympics. So note that these are lower than the numbers for the Summer Games and that we're approaching uh, a 50% but are not really much further into the 40s. So when we talk about gender inequality in sport, what comes to mind to many people is the controversy of getting the women's ski jumping added. So it is being competed for the first time next week when the women will be competing on the normal hill. What's not getting much attention, there are a number of gender issues that I'm questioning why they're not getting much media attention. One of the reasons behind that is because there are serious, serious issues of homophobia in Russia. It's very serious, that are getting a legitimate coverage in the media because they need to be. But I, I am postulating that this coverage of the um, quite homophobic attitude by the Russian government has displaced some of the critique of the gender issues in the Olympic Games. So with the um, addition of the ski jumping, we're led to believe that women can ski jump now. But it doesn't often enter the discourse that women cannot jump from the big hill. They can go up the normal hill, but not from the larger hill, which gives a um, steeper angle, higher height, and flying further distances. Also not in the team events. What's interesting to point out from a historical perspective, looking at the posters from Chamonix in the 1920s, women have a long history of ski jumping. You can see a woman there in her long dress. Um, it was not unusual for women to be joining the men on the hills. So, so events without women. We heard about the ski jumping. Do we know of any others that women still in 2014 do not compete in? There are some. But ski jumping was all we heard about leading up to Vancouver 2010, and we can talk about the politics of that, of how an organized group of dedicated women brought that to our attention. But what about the other events? Nordic combined, pictured there with the men, uh, which combined ski jumping and cross-country skiing. So it made sense if women couldn't ski jump that they wouldn't be able to do the Nordic combined either. But we've got women ski jumping. The next battle is for the Nordic combined. The four-man bobsled, notice that the language is still the four-man bobsled. Sometimes if you watch the World Championship or the World Cup final last weekend, you can see that the women compete in the two-man bobsled. It's almost uh, funny the language that it's, uh, that's used. And the doubles luge is a unique event that the rulebook calls for two competitors. It doesn't specify if they need to be men or women. But every single instance of a doubles luge event in all of the Winter Olympics at which it's been contested has been two men. So the luge gets off the hook of being called out on their gender inequality because they don't mandate it has to be two men. But the men tend to be sliding faster due to the weight. A lot of physics stuff that I've been doing philosophy for so long that I've forgotten all of the scientific aspects. The next slide, please. The other um, more troubling observation, not just that events aren't offered, is that for disciplines that have a reputation of being quite gender neutral, offering fair opportunities for competition, the durations of the events, if you look at what's being competed in, are not all that similar. In every case of the biathlon, the speed skating, the long track and short track, the cross country skiing, the men's longest event is significantly longer than the women's. But for example, a 15 kilometer biathlon versus a 20 kilometer, a 10,000 meter speed skating versus a 5,000 is the longest events. And that's not without implications on the value and intensity of the event. So there's a lot of feminist scholarship that looks at the value judgments attached to competing in the ultra long distance. That it's a tough, a grueling event. But women aren't offered the same opportunity to compete. Keep the slide. In other events, look at the hockey tournament set up. You have 16 men's teams in a tournament and eight women's. Do we have justifiable reasons to allow so much fewer athletes to compete? That's where we get the discrepancy in numbers where we're only having 40% women. 
If we look at other events that offer a two-man bobsled and a two-woman bobsled, if we have 170 athletes competing, we would expect that there would be 80 to 85 men competing and 80 to 85 women competing, but that's not the case. Next slide. Um, it's an outrageously different proportion of numbers, 130 men and 40 women competing. It's because the women don't have the four men to compete in, but also many fewer entry positions. And these are decisions that the IOC has made in conjunction with the international federations. It doesn't have to be this way. They're decisions that are intentionally made on how many athletes will be welcome to register. The skeleton is a new event. 2002 Salt Lake City was the first time that we saw it, except for people who were watching back in the 1920s when they had a tobogganing type race. The skeleton, a new event, we could question why don't we have similar numbers? Why are there 30 qualification spots for men but only 20 for women? Next slide, please. There are some other inequities that I want to draw our attention to as well. The first is the sex verification process for women. There's a long history of sex testing in sport where only women had to verify that they were women and they were eligible to compete. One of the worst stories of sex verification stems back to Winnipeg at the 1967 Pan Am Games, which is one of four international competitions where women were required to do a nude parade in front of a panel of doctors. It's in the newspaper reports, it's in the Pan Am reports that are in the archives at the U of M to prove that they were women that they were not men trying to masquerade as women to compete. So these rules seem outrageous to us today. And in 2000, the test for uh, the chromosome test of the cheek cells was abandoned. But it doesn't mean that sex verification doesn't occur today. Think of the amount of media attention in 2009 surrounding Castor Semenya, the South African runner. So a policy was created by the um, Athletics Track and Field Federation to address how we classify an athlete as a woman or a man. It seems kind of crazy to us. We went from the presence of secondary sex characteristics, the nude parade, to the XX chromosome pattern needing to be there. That was abandoned too because of the amount of genetic variation among, in the human race. Not everyone is an XX or an XY chromosome pattern. To a panel of experts now being replacing that test. So you might remember Castor Semenya was only 18 years old when she was subjected to intense media scrutiny of whether she was a man, something no one would want their daughter to ever have to face. But the policy that resulted is that a team of experts can evaluate a, an athlete on a case-by-case -case basis if their sex has been questioned. So the IOC adopted the track and field policy right before the 2012 uh, London Olympic Games, and it's still in effect. So there's a possibility, it's not very high, but any of our Canadian women athletes could be called in for sex verification and have to have the organ x-rays, the visit with a gynecologist, an endocrinologist, psychologist, interviews with their family, a big process of gender testing. What I want to highlight, this has only ever been for women. There's never been a criteria for men to prove that they were men competing in sport because of the assumption that, well, a woman wouldn't be able to compete. She would stand out as being a woman. The next point. Some of the gender exclusive language um, has come up already in how we refer to the bobsled events, for example. But the Olympic Charter, you might be surprised to find out, is in written entirely in the masculine gender. It's just things that today don't need to be done. Our official documents in Canada aren't gender exclusive. The United Nations aren't. They don't need to be. Uniforms is one that's easier to demonstrate for the Summer Olympics. Think of your differences in men's and women's beach volleyball where until the London 2012 games, it was a maximum of two inches on the side for the bottoms of the women's uniform. Maximum, not minimum. Uh, but pay attention to the figure skating events next week in Sochi, and you'll see clear gender markers, clear gender differences, also in the rule books. And another big one is the underrepresentation of women in leadership roles. Leading up to the year 2000 in the mid-1990s, the IOC set a goal of having 20% women on the IOC to having decision-making capabilities. So they gave themselves an eight-year period to get it up to 20%, not the 50% that we were looking for. And the sad news is that in that time, their numbers actually went down. They didn't increase at all. 
Now with the addition of athletes on the IOC, the Athletes Commission, we have more women in those roles, but not in permanent um, decision-making capabilities. The other final uh, issue I wanted to raise is the idea of the all-male delegation. You might recall prior to the London Olympics that Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Brunei were heavily under scrutiny for never bringing a woman athlete, never naming a woman to the Olympic team. They were told, um, with pressure from the IOC, if you don't include women, we're not going to let your men compete. We're going to basically suspend you from the Olympic movement, which they're doing to India right now. You notice that there'll be no athletes representing India at the Olympics. They'll be competing under the Olympic flag because India has lost its accreditation for the IOC for electing tainted um, leadership people. But there's a lot of questions on the IOC's role here. They've shown us by ban, threatening to ban countries from competing that only bring male athletes that they will engage in gender politics. They will set rules and change rules if there's enough pressure, if there's enough support, and if there's enough will among those hundred and some people who sit on the IOC. So some things I want to think, us to think about. The hidden inequalities, because it's not surprising that people think that the gen if you look at the number of women that Canada brings, it's pretty equal. But Canada's stance towards gender equality is not the same as every country in the world. But that these rules that mandate which events are included on the program, how what the criteria that women will have to face in addition, such as the sex verification procedures, these are set by a body that's self-governing and can choose to change them at their will. They can call a vote and vote to change. So I want to um, ask you to think about and watch next week um, all of the gender politics that are playing out to say what will we see. There will be a lot to analyze and I can call it my uh, February 2014 research program because I will definitely be watching. <laughs> That's research that I will support. Um, and thank you for that talk, Sarah. You certainly, um, I think, made it very clear how small key politics and big politics intersect and are, in fact, inseparable. Our next speaker is Dr. Ryan Compton, also from the University of Manitoba. Dr. Compton is an associate professor of economics at the university. He teaches courses in macroeconomics as well as sport economics. He's been a visitor, um, a visitor at the Central Bank of Brazil and held visiting positions at the University of Western Ontario and the National Economic University in Vietnam. I turn it over to Dr. Compton. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you uh, for the invitation and thanks everyone for coming out tonight. I'm going to try and talk about three different issues in my 10 minutes, so this will either go really well or quite badly. But uh, the good thing for you guys is that if I'm talking about something you're not interested in, check your email, take a deep breath. By the time you come back, I'll be on to something else. So hopefully something that I talk about today will be of interest to you guys. Uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about quickly is uh, the Olympics. So obviously the reason we're having this discussion tonight is with the Olympics beginning in a few days. And you know, as an economist coming into this, I started thinking, well, what could I say that would be of interest uh, you know, in terms of looking at the Olympics? And so as an economist, I'm really interested in looking at, you know, can we expect any sort of economic benefit by having an Olympic game. So, you know, there's a lot of, of money that's spent on these things. You look at the, these figures of sort of $50 billion for Sochi, $40 billion for Beijing, $15 billion for um, London Olympics. I mean, we're talking pretty serious money, especially when you take into account the fact that there's a lot of public money that's involved in this. So, if we're going to be using public resources for these sort of events, what can we expect to get from these events? So, I started to look through the economics literature on this, and what's interesting is that it's pretty strong, pretty, uh, you know, across pretty much any study you come across, you're going to see that largely the, the work coming from economists is that you can't expect much economic benefit from these sorts of games. So there's a lot of spending that goes on, but if you're hoping that this is going to bring about higher rates of economic growth, lower unemployment, um, higher wages, things like that, these don't tend to be the outcomes that we see. Now you might say, well, you know, there's, we're talking about $50 billion in spending. Well, you know, what's going on here? Why don't we see this? 
Well, there's a number of reasons. The one thing I want to point out is that if you're trying to get an economic benefit from spending, you need new spending. So when you think about these dollar values you hear, these are dollar values to host the game. Right? These are costs. Now, the idea here is we're going to be bringing in people to see the games, and that's where we're going to get a lot of benefit, right? Now, one thing you got to keep in mind is, are we getting new spending? So to the extent that you're seeing locals participating in the event, so this is a Grey Cup, a Super Bowl, if this is, uh, you know, an Olympics, is this spending new spending to the economy, or is this spending that's taking place by locals? Now, if locals are spending more money than they would otherwise spend, you might start to see an economic benefit. But if what you're seeing is locals are spending money on the Olympics or the Super Bowl and not spending money on something else they would have spent in the same area, then there's really no new spending going on, right? You say, well, I would have went out to you know, the restaurants, I would have went out to the bars, I would have went out to this entertainment option, but instead, I'm going to the Olympic Games. And so all you're seeing is there's a transfer of spending within the economy, but there's not more spending. Now you might say, well, all these events usually get a lot of tourists. I mean, there's, you know, you see all these stories about the number of tourists that come. True, right? They do get a lot of tourists. But again, you have to think about what could be going on beyond this. So again, you think about something like the London Games, right? There was a lot of people that came to see the London Games from outside of, uh, of England, right? So you say, look, there's all these people coming, they're staying in hotels, they're spending money. Clearly, this should lead to higher rates of growth. But if you look deeper at the numbers, you can see that actually the number of international visitors in London at this time declined. Why? Well, you have to think, there's a group of people coming in to see these games, but that can also displace people. So people who would have otherwise gone to England, right? England in the summer is a pretty popular destination. People who would otherwise have already gone, for other reasons, say, you know what? I'm not going to this year. I'm going to go to Paris. I'm going to stay where I am. I'm going to do something else. I don't want to have to go to London and deal with the boosted prices, all these people running around for the events, possible terrorist you know, attacks or, or violence and things like this. So you see you know, these tourists who would have already been going, not going. You see business travelers who would have had conferences there, who would have had meetings there, not going. Right? They want to avoid that place. They don't want to go there. So sometimes what you see is, you have this group coming in and spending money, but they're displacing others who would have already been there spending money. So again, you don't tend to see the growth that you might expect from this. Right? You're, you're, you don't see this. You know, it's clear that you know, the people that are supporting these games are going to say, look at all these people coming to the Olympics. This is you know, great. But again, you don't tend to see this, what's going on underneath this. Now, is that to say that there's not a benefit to having the Olympics? There's lots of benefits you could point to, but they're not going to be economic benefits. So, you know, from a political standpoint, could we maybe get infrastructure put in place and development of a certain area quicker than we could if we had to go through the normal process of trying to get voters to support it? Yeah, you could maybe point that out from a political perspective. Uh, do Olympics make us feel happy? Yeah, actually there's a lot of research that shows that you know countries that host these events generally often feel better about themselves, happier. It, there is this benefit. But ultimately you have to ask, you know, do these benefits, which are not terribly tangible, are these worth the amount of money that you have to spend to get these things? Okay. Actually, there's an economist at uh, at College of uh, Holy Cross by the name of uh, Victor Matheson, and he he you know, he studies this very strongly. He's got loads and loads of studies. So if any of you are interested in this sort of thing, you know, he's a good person to read because he has tons and tons of studies, time and again, showing that you know this is not a good thing to invest in if you're trying to get growth. Actually, in, in D.C., there has been discussion about trying to host the, uh, I think it's the 2024 games, and he's been an active person saying, look, that's the worst thing you can do. If that's what you want to try, you know, from, from an economic perspective, you're not going to get that. So that's one point I want to make, that from an economic perspective, these are not going to be good, you know, bang for your buck type investments. Now, we've been talking a lot about the Olympics. Another thing that had been uh, suggested to me is, you know, we also want to think about what are the sort of social, cultural, uh, place of sports in society. And so when I started to think about you know, what kind of sports matter in Canada, the thing that really came to mind is hockey, which isn't terribly surprising, right? I didn't think, I didn't think too hard about that. But um, I started to think, well, what can I say about hockey? And you know, the thing that I think has been really interesting lately, that I've been hearing a lot of discussion about, is minor hockey. So, you know, if you read the, the Globe and Mail, if you watch the CBC, if you check out their online uh, websites, there's a lot of discussion about hockey and whether minor hockey is becoming this sort of you know, sport for the wealthy, this elite sport. Now, you know, as a, a I you know, I'm getting older now, but I do remember being a kid, and I, you know, hockey played a big part of my my life, as a, you know, my upbringing. And uh, you know, I now I have three boys, two of which already play hockey, and I spend pretty much every day, you know, in a hockey rink. I was at the hockey rink actually before I came here tonight, and so I see that this is not just something that shapes the life of children; it shapes the life of adults, of parents, right? 
who, who, who go to these things, who spend almost every night or second night with the same adults talking, you know, talking about their kids. And uh, so when I hear this discussion about, you know, the cost of hockey is becoming such that you can't, you know, can't, you know it's, it's limiting our opportunities. It's, it's becoming a sport for the wealthy. I think it's an interesting point, but there's sort of two things I want to focus on. One thing is, you know, when you see some of these numbers, they're just mind-boggling, right? There's this number I've been hearing lately about, um, there's an NHL named Matthew Duchesne, and I guess the story is that his parents are claiming that it cost him about $300,000 over this guy's lifetime to get him into the NHL. When you hear $300,000, it's kind of like, you know, wow, that's pretty impressive, right? But the thing is, I don't think, you know, those numbers are great in the sense that they make people want to read the article, they're going to be, you know, they, they catch you, right? But, you know, as a parent with a child, children playing hockey, is it going to cost me $300,000 for my kid to play in a new sport? I would argue no. Now, here's what I want to focus on. If we're interested in the cost of minor hockey, we have to look at two things. Are we interested in the cost of playing minor hockey, or are we interested in the cost of becoming an elite hockey player? These are two different things, okay? In my mind, I think, you know, from a societal perspective, we should be more concerned about, do children have the opportunity to participate in sport? That's the, big, the bigger driving question. If there are barriers that keep children out of playing sport, that to me is something that we should be concerned about, we should be studying. If there are financial barriers that keep people from being elite athletes, that is less of a priority, at least in my mind. I mean, you know, I talk to some of these parents who have their kids, and you can see that they're looking at this, they're almost looking at this as an investment and a job opportunity, right? And I'm like, that's a pretty small probability event, my friend. That's not a good investment. We should go invest in the Olympics if you want to invest, okay? So, when I look at this again, I would say, that the point I'm trying to get across is, I think we should have a discussion about the, you know, the importance of sports for children, but the importance for elite sports for children to me is less of a policy issue. And this is something we can talk a bit about more afterwards. The second point I want to make about this is that, okay, if we want to argue that elite uh, sports, or, you know, elite hockey is an important issue, and we want to understand how do we fix the barriers to elite hockey, I would like to make the point that I don't think that the high cost of elite hockey is a hockey issue. It's a sports issue. Right? So much of the focus is on hockey because you know, we can all relate, a lot of us have friends and family that play hockey, but if you, you know, it's expensive to outfit a person to play hockey, but once you get beyond that, I, don't, I would argue the costs are really not that different from any other sport. If you're playing elite soccer, baseball, swimming, Irish dancing, any of these things, if you're trying to do it at an elite level, it's going to be extremely costly. And so if we're trying to look at, you know, is there something wrong with hockey because it's so expensive to play at elite level, I'd argue no, it's not hockey, it's sports generally. And if we're trying to understand, you know, is it good that it costs as much to play elite hockey? Is there any sort of cost to society because of this? I don't think the answer lies in hockey, it lies in sports generally. We should be looking broadly across all sports, not just hockey. The last thing I'd like to say is, so moving to my third topic, so hopefully some of the first two have been interesting. If not, let's try with the last one. Um, you know, again, when I'm looking at this sort of social, cultural importance of sports, you know, after I started to think about minor hockey, I then said, well, what, you know, let's think about professional hockey. I lived in Montreal as a kid, and I can, you know, argue pretty strongly about the importance of the Canadians having Quebec culture. And now having been in Winnipeg, now that they have the Jets back, it's pretty clear to see the importance of the Jets out of the city. I can look out, I can see people wearing Jets t-shirts in the audience. I can, uh, you know, when I go to work and we talk, there's a lot of discussion among people about, you know, you may not go to the games, but you're talking about the games, you're talking about the players. It's, you know, it permeates through society. Okay? It's not just one small segment of the city that does this. It seems to be that people broadly are interested in the Jets. And it, it makes you know, people feel good about being in Winnipeg. It's another entertainment option for us. So the thing I was thinking about was, what could I say about this? And I think, what I think would be you know, sort of useful is to think about, well, the Jets are important, the Canadians are important, hockey is important uh, to Canadians. So what do things look like in terms of the stability of professional hockey in Canada? And so when I start to look at some of the, you know, some of the data out there, the, the, the key thing that came to me is I think, you know, we're doing pretty well. I think the, the, the NHL in Canada is pretty stable, very stable actually, when you look sort of over the last 20 or 30 years, right? It's not that long ago that we had a low value for the Canadian dollar. We lost the Winnipeg Jets here. The Quebec Nordiques were lost. In fact, you know, I'm getting older now, some of you might remember this too, but there was a point in time where people were sort of thinking, yeah, the Toronto Maple Leafs are safe. 
maybe Montreal, but there was a lot of concern, what's going to happen to the flames, what's going to happen to the Oilers, what's going to happen to the centers. It, it really became this concern that Canada might be left with one or possibly two teams. When you look at the environment today, though, I'd argue things are much more stable. Why do I think this? Well, one, I think there's extremely strong demand for hockey in Canada right now, for professional hockey. I think it's as strong as it's ever been. How do I know this? Well, you just look at some of the indicators out there. So Forbes is a magazine that has uh, every year they sort of put out you know, the finance or the business of hockey and they look at key indicators. And one thing they look at is franchise value. If you look at the most valuable franchises, all but the Winnipeg Jets are in the top half. And Winnipeg is 16th in terms of the most valuable franchise out of 30 teams. Three out of the top five uh, most valuable franchises are Canadian teams. And so I think these values are reflecting strong markets, strong demand. Also, beyond that, if you look at the secondary markets, so look at tickets that sell on StubHub and places like this. If you look, the most expensive secondary market tickets are almost all Canadian. So, you know, try to get a Jets ticket on StubHub, right? You're going to pay much, much higher above face value, right? This is showing there's an excess demand for these things. People really want to go to these games, right? The tickets are high in terms of face value, they're even higher in terms of the secondary market. Again, this is suggestive of very strong demand. Another thing that I think also helps the case for Canadian teams is hockey has always been, and still to a large extent, is very much a gate-driven business. So are there bumps in the seats, so to speak, right? There's a lot of the revenues through people being in the stands. For a long period of time, particularly when you think about the period of time where we were losing teams, you know, hockey suffered from a really embarrassing TV contract. They did not get much TV revenue. But we see that they have a $2 billion contract now with NBC for the US rights, and we have the recent $5.2 billion with Rogers for the Canadian rates. And so this TV money, I think, is going to go a long way with helps you know, continue to stabilize and you know, give Canadian teams a little bit more a breathing room than they would have had otherwise. In terms of my own, you know, I'm an economist, so I have to be a bit kind of dismal and dire. The only thing that I would sort of worry a little bit about right now is the Canadian dollar. So you know, when we think about the period of time where we were losing teams, you know, I actually used to live in, uh, in Ottawa, and I moved to St. Louis. And I remember moving to St. Louis, and, I saved all this money, and the Canadian dollar was about 65 cents US. Okay, so imagine you take 10,000 Canadian, you put it to your account in the US, you get 6,500 bucks, right? You're like, you got to go to the hospital because your heart starts to hurt, right? Well, when you look at the period of time where we were losing teams, that's kind of the value we're talking about: 65 cents US, 70 cents US. When you look right now, the Canadian dollar has weakened. It was at pretty much at parity, at par. It's down around 90 cents US now. Is that room for major concern? I don't think so. Now, I, I would, I'm pretty sure every executive of every Canadian NHL team is discussing this and is focused on this a little bit and is watching this. And I think it's something that you know is not a, a good sign. But when you look at it, you look at what people are forecasting in terms of how the dollar is going to trade. I don't think there's any concern that we're going to find ourselves at 80 cents US or 70 cents US or 65 cents US. So it's something I think we need to keep our mind on, we have to keep an eye on. And I think that obviously as the Canadian dollar falls, there are negative ramifications, right? Because any of the revenue you have that's Canadian revenue is worth less in US dollar terms. And when you look at the cost of running a franchise, usually the biggest cost is player cost. The player costs are in US dollar terms. So when you've got costs that are US dollar costs, you've got revenues that are Canadian revenue, you know, this could be uh, a problematic. Not just for Canadian teams, but for the entire league due to revenue sharing and, and things like that. So the only point I want to sort of leave with is that you know, we do need to keep an eye on the dollar. It is a bit of an issue, but I don't think it's going to be a big problem in terms of the stability of teams you know, over the foreseeable future. So thanks everybody for listening and uh, thanks again for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, for that interesting talk. Um, before I open up to the floor, open the floor for questions, I just wanted to make a comment about a, a sort of general theme that ran through these, and I don't imagine there'll be much disagreement, but I think each of our presenters did a very good job of arguing that sport has value. And it's what that value is and how it's controlled that really provides us with insights into the relationship between politics and sport. Uh, Russell and Sarah both spoke very eloquently about the symbolic value of sport and how different social movements and political movements can appropriate the symbol of sport and make it their own and use it to advance a cause or use it to raise awareness. Uh, sport is valuable because either people want in or we want to keep people out of sport. That's an exercise of power. That's politics. 
Brian did a very good job of illustrating the different ways that the economy um, adds value, or, or sport adds value to uh, an overall economy. Um, it's that value that is both tied to symbolic and material um, gains that that makes um, makes it worthy of power struggles. And we've seen power struggles between the Canadian economy and the American economy when it comes to the so-called national game of Canada. So I was very I was very struck by that common thread of sport being valuable, but valuable in different ways. So with that, I'll turn it over to the audience to ask questions of our different panelists.